The Wheel of Time Season 2 Episode 4 By the end of Season 1, a major difference with the books was already established. Whereas on the written page, Ishmael was never fully bound to the seal at Sheol Ghul, on the show he was, and was released by Rand at the Eye of the World. Well, here we see another difference. While originally the Forsaken were able to escape from their prison by the general weakening of the Seven Seals, here it is Ishmael himself who goes by releasing them, one by one. And while it diverges from the source material, I think it was a clever choice, because for a visual representation of the series, it would be a little confusing to see them appearing out of nowhere, like they sometimes do in the books. Besides, the tone they chose for Lanfear's summoning brings it closer to a dark fantasy ambientation, which I like. Lastly, I think it's easier this way for the audience to get used to the Forsaken, since, being 13, there are a lot of new characters. This woman represents Chiron in nobility to the core, the style of clothing, the use of wigs, even the furniture in her room, everything yells Chiron thumbs up for that. I was surprised to find out she was Moraine's sister, and I mean surprised to the good, for Moraine does have a number of sisters, one of them indeed called Anvair. It's clear here they want to show explicitly how slowly as that age, making a contrast between Moraine and her younger sister, who looks way older than her now. This is something relevant for Aes Sedai, who can be heard sometimes, mentioning how they miss their families, dead long ago. The only thing I could point out here is that Moraine must be at least 80 years old on the show, to be older than this woman, when actually she's 44. But it doesn't matter really, it doesn't change that much anyway. I love this take from the White Tower. Tarvalon still seems a little smaller than I think it should, but the Agir Grove and South Harbor both follow their proper shapes and locations. Oh, and I can't proceed without mentioning this bandit hem on Nynaeve's cuffs. Jordan would have liked to take five pages at least to describe it. It looks great. Here we go back to Lan, whose bond seems to have been transferred from Moraine to Alana. That would confirm they will merge Alana's character with Morel, who takes Lan's bond. I don't mind Morel being fused with Alana, but Moraine originally transfers her bond with Lan after a very, very important scene, which gives a more dramatic weight to the moment. I sincerely hope that this scene wasn't skipped, because it is one of the very best in the whole series, and it would be a massive disappointment to miss it. On the other hand, here we get a second mention of Katsuin Sedai as a legendary Aes Sedai. By now, it's clear they are setting her up for an epic introduction, so I'm thrilled about that. Nynaeve is going into the arches. Fast as anyone's done since God's wins to die. Up until this point, I was looking at Loghain sideways, because here he seems to be already mad, whereas in the books he's a more than capable man. I was afraid he was going to be merged with Mazarim Taim, but since we now know he's not, I am harboring hopes that he will be returned to sanity when he recovers his ability to channel. I insist, it is a nice touch to show the novices doing chores, like sweeping and brooming, because that's what occupies most of their time. Look closely to this phrase by Leandrin. You know if she falls? You'll fool with her. It really seems like something that only Elida would say. It would be very harmful to this show to have both characters merged, so I'm still clinging to hope that they won't. At least we finally got scenes of Perrin and Elias spending some time alone to explore their wolf brother abilities and how Perrin struggles with them. Here we find out it was Elias all along, the one who helped him and Egwene escape from the White Cloaks back on season 1. And while it seems like something they made up along the way between seasons to compensate for Elias not being present before, it's not out of place. And they were indeed freed by the wolves, so it does compensate to some extent. But what was truly spot on here were the images sent by the wolves to Perrin and Elias. 
This is, in fact, the way they communicate with Wolf Brothers in the books. And it was a great choice to show Hopper, Perrin's friend, telling him his name in this manner. Here we get confirmation that the man Leandrin meets in North Harbor is indeed her son. This seems to be another instance in which they show the slow process of aging for Ice to die, but I think it was enough with Moraine's scene. There was no need to spend so much time with this. More so if you consider that they had to age Leandrin significantly, since she is much younger than Moraine in the books, and, most importantly, they had to change her character fundamentally. Not only she is a dark friend, focused only on herself, and therefore very unlikely to care about someone else, but also as a die having children is extremely rare. On top of which, if there is such a case, it wouldn't certainly be a red Aja sister, since they range from disliking being in the presence of men to outright hating them. At least we finally saw Leandrin acting as the black Aja member she secretly is. Here she seems to be in process of delivering Egwene, Elaine and Nynaeve to the Shonchun, which means she's finally stepping into her proper path. What remains to be seen is whether she was pretending to teach Nynaeve to get her to trust her, and whether she was also lying to Min. In this episode, we find out Min was working with Leandrin under the promise that the Red could take away her curse of seeing visions. We know this is not a thing Leandrin is capable of doing, so it's possible it's just another manipulative move on her part to fulfill her dark red goals. We'll have to wait, although I can say Min interacting with Ishmael is a little bit much. I mean, if the Forsaken was willing to go talk with Min personally, why then the need for an intermediary like Leandrin? Ishmael is way more likely to convince Min than he could take away her visions. As for the ending, well, I suppose I cannot give a full opinion yet, for we have to see how this will ultimately play out, but I didn't quite like this scene. For starters, I'm not a fan of having Moraine actively meddling with every major moment. I agree they have to make her play some role even though she doesn't appear much during this part of the books, but having her defeat Lanfear like this is not believable. It's simply not what I was expecting to have one of the Forsaken stabbed from behind by someone sneaking. The instances in which Moraine was able to put up a fight against the Forsaken were due to her being able to channel Balefire, or simply taking the chance when they were fighting many enemies at once. On the other hand, despite the fact that Lanfear wouldn't fall for that, if she were to be stabbed through the heart, she would certainly die, since the Forsaken, though powerful, are still human, and thus susceptible of physical harm. Here they seem to show them as immortal monsters, but again, this may be subject to change. I'll have to wait for this whole plot to develop before giving my full opinion. Maybe we'll find some answers on episode 5, which I'll be reviewing next week, so if you like my content, please give me a like and subscribe. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.